Welcome, everyone. My name is uh, Federico Tozzi. I'm the executive director of the ILI America Chamber of Commerce. First of all, let me welcome all of you to this uh, masterclass, masterclass bootcamp uh, on uh, products from Piedmont. Uh, before we begin, I would like to thank uh, Jared Zuckerman, our um, social media and marketing strategist that helped us uh, uh, in organizing this event. Uh, Jared, if you are connected, please uh, say hello to all of us. Um, hello, everyone. I'm very excited for the master class. It's been really excited to be part of this, so I'm ready. Thank you. So today we're going to talk about Italian products, authentic Italian products, but uh, specifically from Piemonte. All of you uh, should have received a box like this one that we sent you uh, last week. It's full of great products, and we're gonna talk about these products with two experts in the field. Marco Moschellin and uh, uh, Francesco Lupo. They have uh, a lot of experience. They are engaging speakers, so I'm pretty sure that uh, all of you will, uh, will really like it. Uh, before I give the floor to them, I would like also to uh, acknowledge the fact that uh, this event is part of a, a campaign called uh, True Italian Taste the extraordinary Italian experience. And uh, all this initiative included the dinner that we did last week. The uh, Authentic Italian Table, chef's, chef's Table dinner series are part of this uh, larger campaign. Uh, we are involved as the Italy America Chamber of Commerce in New York, but also it's something that is taking place uh, in many, many other countries, in Europe, in Asia, in United States, uh, Mexico, and Canada. So it's a, it's a big effort. I would like to thank the Italian uh, uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs and uh, our association in Italy, Asso Camera Estero, that you see uh, listed on um, as one of the sponsors organizing the event, one of the organizers. And uh, without further ado, please, uh, you know, Francesco and Marco, join me. And uh, this is uh, this is your time. Okay. Thank you very much. Buongiorno from Piedmont. Okay, no, guys. New York. Sorry. I'm gonna let you work here. I'm gonna get out of the way. Okay, good morning, everybody. My name is Marco Moschellini. It's my and my, Lupo. my name is Francesco Lupo. I am a food specialist, as Marco is. Uh, we bring in the most wonderful product out of Italy, uh, mostly PDO and uh, IGP, which Marco is going to be talking about. And yes, basically so. There's a lot of acronym here. Like, we're going to have a lot of product today. We're going to have some PDO product. We're going to have some PGI product. We're going to have some DOC for the wine, some DOCG what all that means. Basically, they are all uh, connected to traceability and to quality. That's very important. So like basically, PDO means protected denomination of origin in Italian's DOP. And basically it says that the product must be produced and the product must be sourced in a specific region. So everything should come from this region. Um, while instead like for a PGI, it's just a ge protected geographical indication that means that some part of the production must be in a specific geographical area. So today we're gonna to end up for DOC, for the wine, DOC, Nomiazione di Origine Garantita, um, Controllata, and DOC, Nomiazione di Origine Controllata Garantita. So two also for the wine acronym that basically tells you and give you traceability and quality to your product. Basically the logo for DOP, you can see it here on this wonderful shield called Larskera. It's this red and yellow dot. While we have the BGI that we have here on the Aislands, which is this blue and yellow logo. Wherever you see those logos, you know that is a protected product and is a certificate of guarantee for you. So you know that you can trace and check the product. And the DOCG for the wines, which means that it is a guarantee that the production area. But I want to take this away a little bit away from Marco and show you uh, Piedmont because, you know, we talk about PDO, IGP, what that means. It means one thing, terroir, and what the difference makes a terroir on the product. Uh, Piedmont is surrounded by the Alps on one side, uh, lakes on the other side, uh, Ligurian Alps on this side. So it has a very unique micro uh, microclimate in different areas. Uh, for the rice, is the Baraja is in this area. For the RNAs, is in this area. 
for the production of uh, Gnapalano is this area, but the production of Roscara is down this way. And each, each area has its own unique microclimate that adds flavors to the product that can only be done in a specific area. That's the diary I can only create that uniqueness. So if you move that to another section, it could be five, six miles down the line, you will have a different flavor compared to uh, what it's supposed to be. Sorry. No, absolutely. And again, besides we said all the products, today we're going to taste a couple of different products. We're going to taste two cheeses. Uh, we're going to taste some wonderful hazelnuts. We're going to have a video afterwards about rice and Francesca is going to talk to us about Riso di Baraggio, which is the only DOP, Italian rice certified. And we're going to taste some wine. So it's not going to be a bad ride. I believe you will enjoy it. Uh, we would like, since uh, we do a lot of these classes, we like we like to pair things, you know, like today is very, in our opinion, boring to talk about, oh, uh, let's have one product, the history and blah, blah, blah. We want to show you basically how to use the product. Hands down the product, a little bit of history, yes, but also pairing with wine and potential other application in food because that's what we're really going to do. And another thing is that, uh, you know, you may see different products and you don't see any connection to it, but actually everything is connected because of one or because of the terroir. I mean, if you're starting with uh, the rice, you can have uh, risotto with a rasquera, risotto with a granapadano, you can have risotto with a, uh, hazelnuts, you can do a barbera risotto. I mean, there is an interconnection that, and the flavors marry well because of the minerality and the uniqueness of their microclimate. We're talking about, again, terroir. The terroir makes a major difference. And that is the, the most that that uh, Piedmont is represented with is truffles. We have some tagliarine that will go very well with it. Wines, which will be represented, we'll be talking about. And cheeses, which is uh, an, um, it's not a well-known fact, but Piedmont has one of the most varied uh, cheese production in, uh, in Italy. It goes from goat cheeses, cows, and uh, uh, sheep. And also chocolate. And also chocolate, yes, chocolate, 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 chocolate. especially. That they will talk about it. So, like, I think we'll start our journey uh, with our first pairing. So, we'll start with the cheese, I'll start with the cheese, I'll start with the rasquera cheese. So, I just lift up this beautiful cheese. This is a rasquera already. We have like a piece here, but the full wheel is about, it looks like a square, first of all. It's not round, it's a square. That's a typical shape of the rasquera. The rasquera is about 16 pounds worth of weight, uh, it's DOP, so protected, denomination of origins. We have our logo here that certified it. So what is Rasquera? First of all, where Rasquera comes from and where it originated. Rasquera is from the area of Mondovi, this area here, okay? Between Mondovi and Cuneo. Why the name Rasquera? The name Rasquera is because Rasquera takes the name from a lake and a pasture in that area, okay? The cheese as basically history goes back to medieval times. So very, very ancient history. Um, back in the days, the rasquera was made with cow milk and sometimes with a small amount, either of sheep or goat. Today, for the PDO products, they use 100% cow milk, which is very important. Um, basically, also the aging is kind of interesting on rasquera. It's a semi-hard cheese. Uh, the aging goes 30 days if we're talking about pasteurized milk, but rasquera can also come uh, with, made with raw milk. So at that point, it would need a 60 days time for the aging. Um, if you see from the rim, it has a beautiful, noble, light gray mold, and sometimes you can get also to a kind of orangey mold. Those molds are good. That's very important to say, and Francesco can definitely add something yeah. to it, is because like mold are not bad. Actually, if we don't have mold on top of the cheese while they're aging, certain cheese, in this case, Rosquet is one of those, that will mean that there are some problems in the aging. In the I just want to just want to point out some stuff, you know. Sorry, that. Uh, when we talk about cheeses in Piedmont, you know, there's a lot of influence coming from the other side of the Alps, which is uh, the Savoy, and the French are well known for the Blooming Rhine. At the time, there was no really boundaries. This is a cheese that were um, brought back from the dark medieval times by the monks. And one of the reason why this cheese was done in a Blooming Rhine uh, is that it has a flavor that is almost woodsy, uh, meaty. So it was during the Lent period that they needed to have something that could taste like meat, but was no meat. And that's and that's why Rascada or the Blooming Ranch cheeses were born, because they had that 
that meeting that said very different. You know, you taste the milk, but there is other hundred woods flavors that will come out of it. And you may actually take notice of uh, some of the almonds because the surrounding area where the animal eats will be uh, affected. So you will recognize a rascada from the symbol of an R next to the PDO. That's important because if there's, there's no symbol, that means the product is not real rascada. Yeah, exactly. The plastic also, and, uh, and Francesco probably will go on in a little bit, just it has a lot of application. Um, the flavor was the profile for rascada. Profile for rascada, you got some grass, light, mild flavor. So like, to be honest with you, like, um, to, if you're not familiar with rascada personally, and you're more into like um, regular American cheese, probably the most close product could be monster cheese. Monster cheese might be similar to rascada. That's just Sorry. to give you a big Sorry idea. Sorry to interrupt you on that, but you know, I will say that is a unique item. So. Uh, Comparison to the flavor is, uh, uh, it's a uniqueness, you know, it's the comparison for American cheese, so not really. But not just really. to give an idea of the based on how the elasticity, oh, yes. no, no, that, yeah, that's yeah. exactly that's to give I'm sorry about the that. consistency I'm about the cheese. We're trying to create uh, animosity. You know? Of course, absolutely. And, <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> it's my best friend, I'm just, we're just kidding. But like, no, uh, jokes aside, like, um, again, it's a wonderful cheese. It goes on a cheese board, but it has a lot of application because it melts very cool. well. So you will find a lot of Piedmontese dishes having a rascara in it that basically won't even know there are because the cheese is used for, as Francesco would say, for rices, for pastas. It would be great on, on, a, on, a, on a cheese board mixed with some hazelnuts, some honeys. And again, in some recipe also, in meat recipe, it can be used like inside to making bottini and things like that. So uh, one great application for rasquera, one of the most famous, is like mixed with rice. Risotto. So that's Risotto. exactly uh, made a wonderful risotto. And today that's our pairing. That's our first pairing one. To pair this rasquera with a beautiful riso di baraccio di OP and we'll be talking about some now. wonderful rarities. And now your turn for this. So uh, like Marco was saying, you know, when we talk about cheeses, what are going to do with a rasquera? Going back to the terroir, the terroir has connections where actually, you know, one thing gets used for other. Uh, and we're going to start with one of the most important items in the in Italian kitchens, which is the rice. Uh, not all rice is the same. I mean, you know, uh, riso di barraja or barrage rice is very unique because of the terroir, which is in this area between the Novara Vercelli area, which is the rice producing area of Italy, that's where all the Arborio, the, the town of Arborio, by the way, is in between there, belongs to Baraja. The real Arborio is actually a Baraja DOP. Uh, the Arborio that everybody uses is actually a clone of the real uh, the real thing. So if you really want an Arborio, just check for uh, Arborio di Baraja. The production of rice in the area started about 1500s. Uh, the reason was that the area was actually closest to a savanna which was clay, was dry, you know, but it had a microclimate that it was good for uh, rice growing. <clears throat> so what they did is they diverted some of the waters from the Alps into, into the valley, and that's how they started the production of rice. <clears throat> right now in that area, sorry, my, the main rice that it's, uh, uh, it's arborio. Then you have, uh, 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 baldo, which is a typical Italian uh, rice that <coughs> very small. I need a little work. <coughs> I'm sorry. Baldo, cannaroli, and uh, the difference in the the rices is that uh, the amino acids and the dimension of the seed. Uh, why amino acids? Because the uh, the the amount of amino acids will create a, a more creamier risotto or a drier risotto. So, if we want a creamier risotto, you do a cannaroli a herborio or a baldo, which they all done in the Baraja area. What is that unique? The difference between the Baraja and the other growing area of rice in, uh, in Piedmont is the microclimate. Uh, the harvest times are shorter. Uh, the cooler temperature, you know, between March and July is when you pick up the rice. So it actually grows fast and it, the, all the nutrients, it's like an espresso. Everything comes in right away and the flavors are locked in. So they have to pull that out. Once that gets uh, pulled out and dry, it comes out one of the most flavorful uh, rice in the market. Uh, one of the main things is risotto di barbera or rasquera. Um, 
Some other rices that they have is the modus, which is similar to a basmati, but that's used for other different things. I think. Would you also say like the pairing with broiler or nays, which I think would be great in a, in a risotto de barato? Yes, you can. Because uh, another thing about the wines that we're going to talk about is that how they adapt well to the dishes. And that's because of the terroir, once again. We're going back to the terroir. Same thing. We are bringing down always the same thing, terroir. Why is terroir? Because this product can only be made in one area and nowhere else, in Piedmont, in those specific areas. Paraja, because of the condition, the climate, you know, um, everybody thinks that rice is, why is rice natural uh, of Piedmont? Uh, because it has water, it has a lot of uh, uh, great climate to grow that. It was brought by the Arabs in the, uh, during the, the Sicilian invasion, and the rice moved up into, into Piedmont. Um, one of the things about the rice of Baraja is that the flavors. You know, uh, so you can actually find this product in some of the finest uh, markets in the U.S., which some of them carry. Uh, they have, uh, as long as they have the, the logo, the IG, uh, the PDO on the front, this is the symbol from the consortium, which is started in 2007. What a consortium is, a consortium is uh, a group of uh, producers get together and decide the parameters of, of production or of the product. What it means by parameters? They have to be specific. In order to be a PDO, it has to be a specific way of production. It has to be the soil, it has to be the area, the, the geographical area defines the consortium. So if anything is done outside of those consortium, cannot be considered to be a, a PDO. Any? Well, uh, how would you, would you be able also to to basically pair this riso di baraggio with the uh, Royal Arnais. So what, what is the Royal Arnais? What's, what's, oh, Royal what's Arnais, the wine I mean, that goes with it? I mean, the wine. Royal Arnais, by the way, is a grape that uh, came from came back from uh, uh, from the purgatory. Uh, for many years, Royal Arnais has been grown in Piedmont, uh, a small area. The Royal Arnais is actually north of the Lange, which is uh, between the Asti and Alba and Torino area, which is this, uh, this location here. The other Arnais, as the word says, Arnais means a little scoundrel in Piedmontese because it's so difficult to grow and it's so um, futile. I mean, it, it changes with the weather. So you have to be very careful on how uh, you, pro, you produce it. Traditionally, it used to be produced in order to be cut with the uh, Nebbiolo or the Barbera. Uh, but then in 1970, uh, it was brought back as its own. It's a wonderful a fresh, full body white wine. Uh, the flavors are of pears and apples, uh, very fruity. Uh, and that's why the marriage with this cheese would be perfect because it being a bloomy rind, you don't want anything too heavy to destroy the flavor of the cheese or or destroy the delicate flavors of our risotto. So the Royal Anais is the perfect combination. Uh, Royal Anais is uh, grown in other parts of the world, but when you taste the Royal Anais from other parts of the world, you see the uniqueness of Royal Anais, which can only be made in that area. The, the flavor is fresh, crispy, uh, it's wonderful. And another thing, like if you're noticing, we have um, Arnais and other words that we are basically talking about, sounds a lot French. There is a huge French influence in Piedmont oh. because we are at the borders. So uh, a lot of the, the dialect here has a couple of words that are basically mixed with French, which is kind of interesting, you know? So. Uh, a lot, a lot of heritage. One thing I want to point out is it says Roero Arnais, it doesn't say Arnais. So if you buy an Arnais from New Zealand, it doesn't say Roero because Roero is the location where the product is made. Roero is this area. So the Arnais from the Roero area is the one that you want to try and the, the authentic one. And so like now I would like, uh, since we described that, like how well uh, Riso di Baraja with some, with some wonderful Rasquera will go together also pair with a Royal Arnais wine. So you've got already like a, a meal done and in a little bit we'll have even a video showing that. Like we will go on to our second basically pairing and I think I'm going to start, you want to start with the cheese? I think I can go with the wine. Uh, I'll continue with the cheeses because uh, the one cheeses, thing I was saying like Piedmont. Piedmont has great pastures, great mountains, Cooler air, which allows for the product, I mean, for the grass to really grow. So you can have goats, sheep, cow. Cow is big there. Uh, this is a cow milk. This is a cow milk cheese. Um, 
the, one of my first suspense with cheeses in Piedmont was when I was in Torino, when I was a young man, uh, my family sent me back to Piedmont because I was being wild in Sicily. They thought that Piedmont would change me in different ways. It never did. You never did but, exactly <laughs> but one of the things I learned is traveling, walking around to Torino, there was wonderful shops. And one of my favorite shops is called the Bottega de Formaggio, which is one of the most beautiful shops for cheese lovers to go to. And there I was exposed to what the Piedmontese cheese were, especially the goat ones. Uh, the, the mix, they, in Piedmont, they mix a lot of the milks like uh, Duelati, the Bocina, which is a traditional, it's a smaller version of the Rasquera. Uh, and I tasted so much and that was very unique flavors because coming from Sicily, the flavors of cheeses were very peculiar, it was mostly sheep. So when I started tasting the Rasquera and then the famous Grana Padano, where's Grana Padano? I mean, and a Grana Padano is a specific cheese product that's been in existence for about a thousand years in the real form. Um, Grana Padano is produced in five different provinces or regions of, of, of Italy. Anything that's above the Po Valley, uh, uh, Piedmont, Lombardy, uh, Veneto, uh, Emilia Romagna, and Trentino Alto Adige. So when you talk about Grana Padano, not that is PDO. What is, and I recognize a PDO, is by the um, logos on the cheese. Uh, and the Grappadano is a diamond form. That's the word, yes, you can. Uh, so you can, guys, you can see. Yeah, Grappadano was PDO, was uh, uh, created in um, 1996. Uh, it was one of the first PDO awarded by the European community. Everything has to be done in the area. That means the, uh, the cows have to be mil milked in the area. The process of making the cheese has to be done in the area. And the finishing of the cheese needs to be done in the area. One of the main important things is then the production of Arabano, which started with the monks once again in the 18 AD, uh, 800 AD, I'm sorry. 800 AD was to, you know, they have excess milk. So it was raw milk. They started the curdle. The reason why it's called grana is because the granola uh, consistency of the paste, uh, Padano, because of the locality, once again, you know, Plain. the, 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 Padana, Plain. yeah, the, the plains of Perula Padana. And, uh, it, it has to do with the aging too. Uh, he has three agings. The first is between 10 to 16 months. The flavor of the Gran Padano between 16 months is very fresh. Uh, you have flavors of milk, uh, a little define of what the product could be if you use it age a little older. The second aging is 16 months. 16 months is a more defined uh, flavors of uh, nuttiness, but uh, still a lot of creaminess coming through. And the last aging is the Reserva, which is a 20 month. The Reserva, it comes to its own because it's the full expression of the flavor. So when you're looking for that, you know, uh, you can actually have a flight of three gram banana into the into uh, your uh, experience. You can have, uh, for your charcuterie board, you can have uh, the 10 to 12 months. For your cooking, your risotto, you can have the 16 months. And as a dessert or finishing, you can have the reserve of 20 months of the Grand Absolutely, like, yeah. and, uh, and also about the production, again, like um, there's a huge, we are talking about a very big cheese. Like here you see, what you see right here is one eighth of a wheel. It's 80 pounds. The it's wheel is 80 pounds. Pound. Uh, in order to make an 80 pound wheel, uh, you have to use about 500 to 600 liters of milk, which is equivalent of 294 gallons of milk. So for every pound of, for one pound of grana, you use about uh, two gallons of milk. So that's the ratio. So. And as it gets older, the flavors, you know, being a, a cow's milk cheese, you know, it gets uh, uh, the lactose, uh, which uh, doesn't have that lactose in the product. So you can actually eat it if you're lactose tolerant. Um, but, but the sugars become sweeter versus like a, a sheep milk where the, it gets a little sharper and it gets a little salty. Cow's milk, this will get sweeter, it gets older. That's why I was saying the reserve is great for dessert, you know, as a finishing cheese or, you know, with a great glass of red barbera. barbera. Yeah, absolutely. So, and, and um, you know, well, don't forget, we, we take, we'll take questions online too. And if you have any questions, we'll be more than happy to answer your questions. Uh, I just want to point this out, and then I'll, my friend will be talking about some of the wines. What you see here is a representation of the bountifulness of Piedmont. 
uh, was starting with the Grissini. The Grissini were invented in Torino. Uh, great wheat, wonderful. They need something to go with their cheeses. That's why we get the cheeses. Uh, the Tano Bra is well known for charcuterie, for salumi. Uh, so you'll have that added to it. Uh, the Tagliarin, once again, the eggs of Piedmont are wonderful. It's a perfect marriage, you know, uh, with the white truffles. And, uh, and the yeah, Rarnais yeah, always goes with everything, you know. Exactly. By the way, the Rarnais is a versatile wine, which is fresh. It's great for uh, to start the dinner you know, or to start you know, as an aperitif. And it's good enough to finish up the meal with it. Right, exactly. And plus, like, again, talking about the tajarin. The tajarin is also great. Just you shape, you put some butter in it and a little shape of grana. And that's how you try them because they are so refined in flavor. That's how you want to have it. And that's why also, as Francesco said, you have white truffle, you got black truffle from Piedmont, you got porcini mushroom from Piedmont. So like how you do like the tallarin to taste, how you taste truffle the best way. Like it's not by making it too complicated. Either you shave it on a sunny side egg, that's the best way to do it. Or with a simple tallarin with a little bit of butter and shave that truffle. There's one thing I want to point out is you guys see uh, some, some hazel nuts. What's unique about hazelnuts in Piedmont? Uh, well, you know, there's a thing called janduja, yeah. which then turned out to be a cream of be. hazelnuts. But my friend is going to be talking about the hazelnuts and tell you why they're so unique. Because you know, when I read about it, oh, sorry, I'm destroying the place. But when I read about it, I mean, uh, now I understand why Piedmont is well known for the hazelnut creams and the janduja. Yep. So, like, basically, as we were saying, we keep on like. We were talking about grana. Francesco was giving you a very good idea of what grana is. And our idea is as we pair Roero Arnais with Rasquera, we pair. And uh, basically now we want to do the same thing with, uh, with grana. And the pairing for grana will be a wonderful Barbera. Barbera is uh, one of the most common wine of Piedmont. So we have basically the area of Alba, Monferrato, and Asti. In this area up here is where the magic happens. And consider that the DOC of Barbera, uh, the 50% of the DOC you find them in Piedmont. So what Barbera is a red wine, great is Barbera. So 100% Barbera. And what is typical about Barbera? About Barbera, the typical thing is that it's a ruby red wine, has got a 13% more or less alcoholic percentage. And Barbera is unique because it's very high on acidity. So high acidity, low tannin. What does that mean? That goes perfectly, this wine, with some fatty food. Because in Piedmont, it's a very rich cuisine. We're talking about the north of Italy. If you consider here, you got Val d'Aosta, Switzerland, and France here. So we're talking about basically top north of Italy. So what's happened there, it gets pretty cold. So you need some comfort food most of the time. Like, uh, and they have, like, as Francesco said, a lot of cheeses, a lot of cold cuts, a lot of meats, like the sauces are heavy, somehow bagna cauda. So you need some wine that cuts well, that fat. You know, what I'm going to say is uh, one of my experiences in Piedmont when I was in Torino is at five in the morning when you went to a, a bar, you know, uh, in Sicily it's traditional to have an espresso or a cappuccino. <laughs> But in Piedmont, is to have a glass of red wine is uh, the norm. Yeah, yeah. 10 a.m. is the norm to yep. run. So, uh, 10 a.m. is typical. Like, I'm from Genoa. I'm a little bit south of it. Like, here's Liguria, so I'm from here. We drink, in my region, the reds from Piedmont. So, and Barbera is one of the most classic ones. Again, which are the main DOC of Barbera? Definitely Barbera d'Asti, Barbera d'Alba, and Barbera del Monferrato. Don't forget what the OC means. So the denomination, the denomination of, of control of origin, denomination di origine controllata. That means exactly that the production must be in the area and only in the area of uh, Alba, Asti, and Monferrato. Barbera goes phenomenally with, uh, as I told you, game meats, cheeses, salumi, and so many other dishes. And again, like the pairing with grana is phenomenal because grana is not an heavy cheese, but it's a rich cheese. So if you want to clean your palate after every bite of grana, Barbera is definitely something you would like to enjoy with it. And there's another thing. Let's not forget that the wines of Piedmont are great as an ingredient. I mean, there are rain and you know, if you're bracing meats and stuff, it adds a, a fresh fruity notes to it. 
if you're making a risotto, the Barbera would be perfect, you know, because it gives that uh, umami flavor. I mean, uh, uh, it's a word that everybody here likes to use, but there's another way of describing the meatiness that a Barbera would add to uh, to risotto or uh, to anything else that you add to it. You know, if you do a brasato, if you, if you do anything else, the red wines from Piedmont are perfect. Just because, you know, I mean, I, I prefer you using a, a good wine to prepare a great dish because that will give me the outcome I'm looking for. I really don't want to destroy a great piece of meat or, or chicken or anything else with a low quality wine because the acidity, you know, like we was talking about, you want to make sure that the fruitiness, you know, it's not just to deglaze a pan, it's actually to add flavors that are in, incorporated into the wine. And the profile of Barbera, which is very important if you ask me, like, uh, what is the profile of Barbera? Barbera, it, be, it could be like, as I told you, acidity, and then you can have some like nice floral notes. And the Barbera, instead that are aged longer, you get more like robust flavor and more like uh, basically ripe cherry notes. So that really depends on the aging on the product itself and the terroir, of course, and as I, usual. And another thing I want to say is, uh, you know, just because uh, since Barbera, it doesn't have another B starring name to it, doesn't mean that it's a lesser quality. Actually, Barbera wines, you know, are the everyday wines that Piedmontese wear on the table as the dining. Uh, but, you know, the quality of the wine is not based on the price point. But, no, but Barbera, you know, Barbera because, Superiore, there are high quality of Barbera again. Barbera and Dolcetto, as Francesco said, are mostly like the wine that you have on your everyday, everyday meal. But again, they face a competition of very high-end Nebbiolo, Barbaresco, and Barolo because the quality of Barbera is excellent. So don't think as Barbera as a wine that is just cheap, actually is a phenomenal wine. And as I said, there are different varieties for it. I think uh, I think exploring uh, new wines is a great idea. Like the Rara Nase is uh, wonderful because you know white wines uh, we always uh, fall into uh the, the norm and uh, you know either the new yeah. zealand or the australian so, sauvignon blanc, sauvignon blanc the you know uh or, you know maybe you know if you're a very explorative like a friend of mine you go to the Casarato or you know to some of the sicilian ones but you know Renés for me will be a great everyday wine it will be a great uh, table summer and winter because you know everybody thinks you know white wines in the summer but in the winter if you you know, lunchtime, yep. you know, will be perfect. Uh, the evening, you can have a nice Barbera to go with it. I mean, you cut a little cheese, a little rascada, and the summer Renees will be perfect. It will be a little dense. It will, you know, the Barbera will be a little too tough because of the, how delicate the cheese is. So you really want to be a little bit careful. Well with the grana. But the grana will be perfect. I mean, you know, uh, the Barbera will be perfect with the grana, will be perfect uh, with uh, an older rascada yep. because, you know, if you get an older rascada, something has, a more stiff, something more. Yeah, that has flavors, you know, like, you know, because like I was saying before, uh, cow's milk cheeses, as they age, they define themselves. You can actually taste, if it was a raw milk cheese like the grana or the rascada, you can actually taste what the animal ate with the area defined by the flavor profile. Uh, the wines, the minerals in the wine sometimes, with location that's very really close by, will balance themselves out. It's all about balancing flavors. So when you're doing tastings, you know, if, if you you want to maintain that regionality or you want to maintain, I mean, those would go great with a sparkling wine, a French Corta or uh, a Prosecco. I mean, that's something that's a little drier though, not too sweet because it will contrast. If you're too sweet, you want to do another typical uh, uh, cheese from Piedmont, which is Gorgonzola. So, yeah, that's, people that's think that's from Lombardy, but it's actually from Piedmont. Yeah, and another another thing again for, for Barbera, which is very important to say, the 13% alcohol make it very drinkable. So if we are used to big cab of California that are very rich, like Barbera will taste definitely lighter, but way more drinkable. So it's an everyday wine that you can bear. I'm not will say, I won't dare to bear it with fish. It's too much for a no, Barbera. No, fish, no, fish you want to go with this guy. But uh, there I are mean, a couple uh, of reds lighter that can bear with fish. I won't talk yeah. for Barbera, but- Definitely for polenta. Many, polenta, yeah, but yeah. for many, many dishes, again, rice, Pasta Beef. and meats. That's, you know, that's the one for you. One thing that, that people don't know is that Piedmont actually has a, a great uh, breed of cows. It's called uh, the Piemontese, which is similar to Canina from Tuscany or the Chevrolet Passana. from France. It's a big white cow from Roman times and has a lot of flavor. So, you know, this is a steak point right here. So the Barbera has to go with it. And uh, now, like, 
we're gonna end on a sweet note before uh, we're gonna introduce again Federico to have this video for uh, Rizzo Ibaraja. We're gonna end on a sweet note and uh, we're gonna talk a little bit of what Francesco already started, but that's my real passion. It's the uh, hazelnut. Tonda Gentile Trilobata Piemontese. Trilobata, why? Because it has three lobes. So if you take, I, put, uh, I have it here, I have them here. <laughs> yes. I took like yes, the hazelnut uh, to show you the differences. So these are, now if you can see, these are common hazelnuts. All right, you see that they have any regular shape, they have a little skin on. Just look at the color. All right, these are regular hazelnuts. And this instead is the trilobata. You see, it almost look like almost like a like a chickpea, but it's not. Yet the trilobata means they have three lobes, and that's the characteristic of this hazelnut. What else it is? It's a basically considered the best hazelnut in the world. It's a PGI product, so it's protected geographical indication. Should come just from the area of Piedmont, specifically. Roero area, Roero. where the Roero arnais come from. So here we go, another analogy. And what this wonderful hazelnut has, first of all, a fantastic yield, because it's, it's round, the, the, uh, the, current, the, the external part, whether you crack, is very thin, the skin. the skin is thin, so wonderful yield for it. And most and foremost, it's rich on oleic acids. What oleic acids are? Oleic acids are the one who fight bad cholesterol. So today, especially with a lot of fat, and now with COVID uh, and all the troubles that we have, probably our diet are not always fantastic. Well, you need something fighting cholesterol. This hazelnut does the job. So basically, a diet rich on oleic acid helps build up good cholesterol and fights bad cholesterol. So that's a phenomenal thing about One thing hazelnut. I like to say about that uh, hazelnut is that, you know, uh, we're going to finish up the dinner that we just had, right? You know, the rice, the appetizer, the cheeses. Uh, one of the things is that it has a low, um, low fats compared to other nuts. So it actually is workable for the pastry industry. That's why you can make cream with it. That's the Janduja was, was, was created. Uh, we forget that. Uh, I wanted to say another thing. Oh, sure. <laughs> it's very, it's very like uh, knowledgeable, but yes, to let me talk sometimes. No, 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 no. And no, anyway, uh, no, no, what I want to say, I want to say a no, couple no, of sure. other things. Uh, some anecdote, a very fun one on the on the Tonda Gentile. It's actually of the time of Napoleonic time. It's 1806. Basically, north of Italy was in the hands of the French people. So Napoleon was at war with England. So there was, um, there was basically a complete freeze in trades with England. And where you get cocoa, you'll get it from England. So like uh, the confectionery and pastry chef of terrain, they were desperate about it because they couldn't make any cocoa desserts where they make a lot. So what they did, they mixed the little cocoa they have left with a lot of this wonderful hazelnuts that was abundant at the time. And so from that time, mixing that chocolate with some hazelnut, some sugar, some milk, create the magic of janduja. Janduja is what Francesco was trying exactly to say before. Janduja is this beautiful cream of hazelnut and chocolate together. From janduja come one of the most famous chocolate in Piedmont, which is janduyotto. Janduja in Piedmont is also a mask of the Commedia dell'arte. Janduyotto is the son of this mask called janduja. So, Janduja is delicious, but something that we know even better that in the beginning was made with this wonderful nuts is a pretty well-known uh, hazelnut cream that was started in 1960 by Mr. Ferrero in the Piedmo called Nutella. Nutella, the first Nutella was made with this hazelnut. Today, of course, Nutella is well-known worldwide. It's mass produced, sadly. Uh, there won't be enough hazelnut to make Nutella with the Tonda Gentile. But again, we want to remember that the success of this wonderful product, which is Nutella that we all enjoy today, started with this hazelnut. And, and again, and also hazelnut is not just with confectionery chocolates, but we talk also about a very famous traditional cake from Piedmont with the hazelnut cake. And, and then also the Bacio di Dama that you have in your presentation. Bacio di Dama is Lady Kiss 
it's uh, literally a cookie that you have like the two cookies in the middle has a little bit, it almost looks like a little sandwich. You have two cookies made out of hazelnuts from the Gentile in the middle a little chocolate. It's called Lady's Kiss because you remember two lips of a lady put together. So yes, that's basically. Uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna finish it off uh, in bellezza as we say in Italian. I'm gonna finish it off with the Bicherin. Bicherin is a classic uh, coffee drink in Turin. Uh, we all know that you know, a lot of people think espresso and coffee is very popular or it came because of uh, you know, the other side of in the Trieste area. But actually, one of the biggest uh, coffee roaster in Italy is, uh, is in Turin. Uh, you know, I don't know if I mentioned, can mention the name, but you know, we prefer not to. But you know, in the 1800s, uh, coffee and chocolate and hazelnuts were one of the pastime of the elite of Turin. And uh, the Bicherin, which is uh, hazelnut, uh, chocolate and espresso. It's a classic uh, winter drink that you love in the afternoon. Instead of tea, they have a bicherine. Well, thank you guys. Before we go on with the, with the video that we're going to show you, I would like to uh, ask you a few questions because we are receiving uh, some questions uh, uh, from our uh, audience. So the first one was how difficult uh, is to find uh, products from Piemonte, PDO, PGI products from Piemonte in the United States and especially in New York, New York Metro, since uh, you know more of our friends, are, uh, the majority of our friends are based here. I mean, actually, uh, if you want to start, you know, I mean, I, we, we can actually work it together because we have different visions. He does retail, they're mostly full service. He takes care of uh, retailers, I think, restaurants and, and bigger share. Uh, what I, what's happening is it was easier, believe it or not, a couple years back. Uh, because artisanal producers were allowed to export their product. Now, there's certain rules that the FDA put into, into place that limits uh, and puts extra expenses on some of the producers. So they are questioning the, the export into the US. But traditionally, New York or a metropolitan area similar to New York, like, you know, would be the Boston or Los Angeles, it's, a, it's a very easy. Very easy because there is people that specializes on bringing the specific uh, product out there. I mean, from the wines, uh, you know, on this table, probably the only one that may have uh, some, uh, I would say difficult, some difficulties because there is cheaper product on the market or that it's similar, but you know, actually benefits from the name and, and the efforts that they put out uh, will be the rice, but everything else is quite easily av available. Uh, the only thing that you cannot find on, on the community side will be salumi because of USDA rules. Uh, but everything else is, is um, you can find it. I mean, you can find this, uh, some of the fine retailers. Uh, I mean, even, in, can I mention the name? Yes, yeah, you can mention some of the I mean, you can, from, it, uh, from Italy, uh, which has most of the stuff. Uh, you can get it from Whole Foods. I mean, if you're in the Midwest, I don't know how many of you are in the Midwest, you can go to some of the chains like Kroger, will have it. some friends from Texas as You know, well. Giants yeah. in, in, uh, in uh, Mid-Atlantic, you know, there is, uh, HB markets, you know, there is actually the, there is the what I call the medium upscale uh, uh, supermarket will carry most of this product. And traditionally, some of the old uh, uh, Italian uh, uh, retailers that are in the, some of those sounds that you find them will have this product in there. I mean, you know, years ago there used to be one called in Luca, but it's no longer around. But also, also to mention, like, uh, oh, don't forget the Paolo in New York City is that right. one of. Also to mention, like uh, again, uh, Francesco mentioned Kroger specifically. I will say the Kroger that has the Mars cheese counter because those are the ones that carry the special cheeses. So they probably have, uh, I don't know if there were 300, I think they're expanding right now, but also online. So how you can find it for if you are basically connected from all over the country, uh, how you find them, it's basically you can use as we always do Google. So you Google what is important is for this product that you Google Rasquera PDO, Grana Padano PDO or DOP. So it's very important because when you go on the shopping section and you can find purveyor that can provide the product. What is tougher in my opinion is to find online the authenticity. So your research should be uh, well done. So you have to add that they are either they are PDO or PGI product to really find the authentic. But nowadays, definitely with online expanding due to COVID home delivery, it's easier somehow to get access to product that before were just a niche and were available just for people that are were close by to certain store. We are lucky to be in New York in big cities. There's 
but again, today, like with the in definitely improvement of, of uh, home sales and stuff like that, and home delivery from main chains, like you have the chance wherever you are in the United States to try those products and to get them in your house. There's, there's one thing I want to point out though, and uh, this is from experience and from being on the retail side, has been uh, it used to be on, on the uh, managerial side of uh, running stores that specialize in products like this. The thing that you really want is you want to find a purveyor that has the passion, that knows his product, especially when you're asking about cheeses. You know, uh, if they, if you go there and you ask who, you know, you see the mascara but you don't know, or you see a cheese that you don't know, and you ask the questions and, and the answer is not satisfying, just walk away, because you know if they don't have enough passion to learn about their product, it's not it's not a retailer I want to do business with. Uh, but because you need to transfer that, because then it will indicate to me what condition the cheese was uh, was taken care of in the, in, the, in the counter. Because, you know, if this uh, doesn't have the optimal conditions, you know, if there were next, if you put a, a cheese next to a refrigerator with an onion next to it, it will taste like onions. So really because they have, they have sour flavors. Uh, if you put the, the nuts in a, in a temperature that's too hot, they will, they will uh, get oxidized, they will get uh, rancid. You don't, you don't want stuff like that. You want to make sure that it's somebody that's knowledgeable on what he has. Like you said, Google is a perfect way. On the internet, by looking at the at, at the site, you get a feel to it if they actually mean it. As much information they give you, and how much PDO they carry. If they carry only one PDO and everything else is mediocre, then you know that you want to look somewhere else. And this was exactly another question. It was about uh, uh, that uh, some of our friends uh, uh, that are listening to us they were complaining that. When they go to a store, you know the, the two uh, trademarks that we show, you know the PDO BGI, they're not prominently displayed. Yes, yeah. uh, sometimes, uh, you know, you can see uh, things like uh, you know domestic uh, yes. grana. Actually, or, they take advantage or, of that. Or, or, or domestic parmesan, you know. Uh, and the point is, uh, as a consumer, sometimes it's difficult to understand uh, because the retailers. And, so, and I'll start the discussion, and it's going to finish it because you know we, this is a two, three. Part discussion. You know, when you come to that, is um, there is some misconception sometimes from uh, the operators. And when I mean operators, could be a restaurant, could be a, a, a retailer, it could be a, anybody, a distributor that imports the product. But the public don't know as much, or doesn't need to know as much, which is the reverse of what I was trained in. Uh, I think that the, the consumer needs to know what a PDO is. And if it's a PDO, I want it nice and, and big. Uh, I want to know when you. You know, uh, some people uh, have some financial gain by uh, confusing, the, uh, like after we say in Italian, changing the, the cards in the mm -hmm. table. So because they get higher uh, margins on certain products that cost less than that, down to parameters. I mean, I have nothing against uh, cheeses that are made in other countries, as long as they are defined by their own uniqueness and not by copying or giving me a less, uh, valuable product than, than they're trying to copy. Because when you try to copy, there's only one, mean, one meaning, is to cheat the consumer. So as much as everybody says, so oh, it's domestically made and we make it the same way, the family has been making the same cheese in Lombardy for 200 years, so many things. The cows in Wisconsin cannot and don't have the flavors of the cows of Piedmont or Lombardy or anywhere else in Italy because the terroir minerals, the micro uh, climate is what makes the difference. And again, don't 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 get us wrong. Like uh, to me, like my point of view is that today, thank God, we are going towards a world of excellence. So uh, being made in Italy, made in the US, made wherever like is a little bit less important. Today we are looking about excellence. So what video PGI represent is basically traceability and quality. So that's why those products will always be there on the market, hopefully so, and still sell. Um, it's very also important what Francesco said is the fact that I have believed that today, like millennial consumer are very curious. So they will do their research and they will ask the guy at the counter. And then the story goes back to exactly what Francesco said before. If you don't find somebody that likes to be engaged and don't know his product, you know that probably that counter, the cheese counter won't be that great. That doesn't mean that you know that the story is bad or anything, but you need to have people behind the counter who really are in love with what they're doing. Uh, I, I, I just like to mention a small chain in the Midwest, uh, in Minneapolis called Kowalski Market. They have a wonderful cheese counter. 
they have cheese specialists. Those people are all in love with it. Maris cheese is similar to that. There's a lot today, thank God, going back to the passion. concept. Yeah, going back to the concept of farm to table in the United States, Kilometro Zero in Italy. Sustainable farming. It's sustainable farming where people are really asking more. Uh, so I believe we are a step ahead, thank God, to where we were a couple of years ago, where people say, oh, Parmesan, yeah, well, Parmigiano, Grana is the same you know, thing. You know, the internet actually has some benefits. <laughs> yeah. Well, they, <laughs> actually works both ways. Be careful when you're reading the internet because our, our the source and always check on the source. But yeah, going back, the, the, no, there is another. The last thing is uh, to also answer to our friends is that there is an aspect that both of you have touched. It's like by buying a PDO or PGI products from Italy or from all the places in, yeah. in European Union, because this is not something that yeah, is exactly. unique from Italy. Italy is one of the countries with the highest dominant, you know, PDO the highest number of PDOs. Number. Yes. Uh, the point is that it's it's a way of guarantee the consumer that that, that product has been treated in a specific way, yeah. and and so you, you can be sure that the product is healthy. It's uh, and, uh, and, and it's not being in, and that promise is not the promise that is made by a company, but it's made by by can a third I, party. Can I can I go into a, the legalities of that because that's very important. Uh, the yellow symbol there is not just there to be to show that it's a yellow symbol and it's a. In order to get a yellow symbol, you have to have 20 years of proven track record as a consortium, which means the producers get together and set the parameters of production. Either it be cheese, either it be wine. Those, you know, one of the main things is the geographical the, the, the denomination, the area that defines, because the terroir is what makes the product, main, main quarter. That's in all the changes. Absolutely. But on a legal aspect is that I cannot sell you a product telling you that it's a PDO that is not, because that's called fraud. Yep. It's the same as if you were buying a Rolex in Chinatown and I'm buying a Rolex in Switzerland. Yep. So it's the same thing. It's the same fraud. There's no changes. If you're buying a Chanel bag or if you want to buy a fake, you know, there is a copyright. There is, because the, the PDO gives you a, a, a security that the product is done specifically and it comes from there. Absolutely. If the PDO is not there, don't buy it. Well, I, before we, uh, we show you uh, <coughs> a little video, because uh, I just want to make sure that everyone connects with what we put in the box, because you should have found um, a bottle of wine, uh, Barbera d'Alba, or uh, a bottle of uh, uh, Roero Arnais. You should have found uh, um, some uh, uh, hazelnuts. Uh, we, we added two cheeses. You, of course, you know, we have a big wheel here, but you know, you have both of them. Uh, they, they, you can distinguish them by um, the label on it. One is uh, Grana Padano, and the other one is Raschera. So uh, if you have uh, you know, some problem in identifying the product, it should be very easy because it, it's right here. Uh, as you say, you know, we, uh, uh, we try to source this product directly from Italian producers. So uh, uh, we're gonna show you a brief video uh, from the area where they were sourced, uh, and uh, with a brief, uh, you know, recipe from a, a very famous uh, chef that uh, uh, our good friend uh, and partner in this initiative, Dino Icardi from Sevinova, uh, found for us. So let's look at the video first, and uh, when we finish, uh, we'll say hello to Dino as well. Thank you. <coughs> Hi, my name is Renatardo Torre, chef of the restaurant Le Luna in Guarellone, Piemonte. Today I'm cooking for you a traditional risotto with the Macquero Nays white wine. Chef Davide is toasting the rice. This is the first part of the preparation of this dish. Hi, my name is Fabrizio Cravanzola, one method from Premonte. I'm also the president of a group of uh, wine and food producers from Italy called Export Quality Wines. Today I'm presenting you two of my wines. Royero Arnaiz and 
Barbera da. Cheers. Welcome back. Uh, thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed the video. I would like to ask our friend Dino Icardi from uh, Savinova and Alba Export that has, uh, you know, has sourced this product directly uh, in Piemonte to say a few words. Dino, if you just want to say hello to all our, you know, uh, friends here in United in United States. Prego. Uh, good day. Uh, I am uh, Dino Icardi. I am the director of the Savinova. I would uh, like to thank you all uh, for the great opportunity uh, you uh, give uh, us um, to lean, uh, do you know our producer and uh, for the, our region of the Piemont. Uh, I would like uh, to thank you, the director, the special director, the special friend, the very important man uh, of uh, Mr. Federico Tozzi. Uh, the director of the Italian Chamber of the Commerce, and um, who believed uh, in our product and in our activities uh, through a pluriannual annual, the cooperation with the, the Italian Chamber of uh, the Commerce in New York. And thank you very much for this important, important opportunity. Um, a good work. Uh, thank you. Now it's really time to go. So I would like to thank all of you that participated in this um, masterclass. Please let us uh, have uh, your comments. Uh, we are interested in what you think. Uh, we're going to do many more of this initiative. I would like to thank uh, Marco Moschelin and Francesco Lugo and uh, asking them to join me here for Umbrindisi. To all of you, Hope you enjoy the product, enjoy the wine that we send you, and uh, buon appetito. Salute. 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 Cheers. Cheers.